Rick, give us your sense of, of this market from your point of view. I mean, you're putting money to work all the time, both on fixed income mm -hmm. and also in equities. What do you make of this market right now? So, I mean, David, I mean, you, you think about it. We came in the beginning of this week and said, well, you've got energy caps. You've got the turning off of Nord Stream. You've got China growth, China COVID, China Taiwan. You've got a series of issues uh, that are that are hard to get your arms around. By the way, the good sector of the U.S. economy is softening. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges out there in the, in the world. That being said, you know, if you take a step back and you think about as an investor, you know, with the Fed moving rates higher, all of a sudden you could buy short end interest rates at, at levels we haven't seen in a really long time. I was thinking about a year or two ago, you know, you had to pay less than 1% to fund companies, 50 basis points. I saw Amazon did it all 25 basis points in three years. All of a sudden you could buy, you could buy short end assets at four, four and a half, five percent, put some money to work, get some carry, and then tactically look at areas that are that are where there's opportunity. And listen, I mean, you can get really, really concerned about where the world is. When you when you step back and think about U.S. economy, we think is going to have nominal GDP this year of five percent, nominal GDP of five. You know, you've got a service sector that's doing well. You've got a healthcare sector that's doing well. You've got parts of the economy. So. There's things to do. I mean, you know, while it is one of the most challenging, uncertain times that we've seen in markets in a long time with central banks tightening, there's some things to do in the markets, and there's some there's some reason to, to look at some uh, some opportunities out there. So the difference, as my math works, from a quarter of a percent to five percent is a pretty big difference. That sounds pretty good to get that kind of return. At the same time, it depends on what's going on in inflation, right? We've got CPI numbers coming out next week. If we've got a headline inflation around eight and we've got core around five or six, that five percent doesn't look quite so good, does it? It actually doesn't look good at all. And if you assume that we're going to be running at those sort of levels for a period of time, but you look at where the inflation markets are, where the where real capital, including ourselves, are transacting, and today we were we were locking in inflation in two years at under 2.2 percent for two years, five years, five years are around two and a half percent, ten years are around 2.4. So if you say, "Gosh, I can buy one and two year high quality assets at four and a half to five, I'm Protecting my inflation risk in the low twos, boy, I'm locking in real rates. I'm financing companies. By the way, not just companies, commercial mortgages. I'm financing companies with a real rate that's pretty attractive. And you can actually, people can talk about the stickiness of inflation, which is real. Shelter inflation's high, wages are high, but boy, you can do some things in the market that can that can certainly hedge your uh, your inflation risk and then and, and, you know carry quite well in the market today so if the inflation risk is not what some people fear it is it's actually coming down why is that is that because the fed is tightening it's tightening the, the money or is it actually is there something in the notion of the supply chain is loosening up some so i think it's two parts one i think the fed deserves an awful lot of credit listen i was there was enough criticism to go around myself included that last year they waited too long qe i think that's been well chronicled this year they cannot be any more clear. They cannot be uh, more more strident in inflation is, is what they're doing, and they're not going to back off that. And, you know, I think they're going to get the funds rate to four, three and three quarters to four, probably four. And then I think they're going to let long and variable lags of monetary policy do their thing. So they're pretty clear. So I think there's a credibility from the Fed that I think you've, you've, got, to, uh, you've got to applaud in terms of what they're doing today. Second is, as you said, supply chain, you see real, real improvement in supply chains. You see it in some of the PPI numbers. You see freight costs coming down. You see commodity costs coming down. So there are some reasons to see you to, to see that, um, that gosh, some of this inflation, you know, by the way, you also see an inventory levels. Look at retailers, their inventory levels are up quite a bit. In fact, there's not there's not places to put some things today. So you'll see some price discounts um, there. And, uh, and by the way, in semiconductors, it's not it's not perfectly solved around supply chains. But look at some of the semiconductor sh uh, stocks these days. People are concerned about oversupply. That's not something we've talked about for a long time. So it's better, and there's some reason for optimism. But I think you have to start with a central bank. That is, there is no ambiguity, and they're quite clear in how they're communicating that. Uh, talk about the divergence of the economies around the world, because we're sure seeing We saw the ECB raise 75 basis points this week, and they say it's going to get worse before it gets better. They've got an energy crisis in Europe. I think it's fair to call it that. China is slowing down its challenge. Uh, Japan has its own challenges. Are there opportunities or challenges in that divergence among the economies? So, I mean, I, boy, there's such a multifaceted question, David. You think about, you know, why is the dollar doing what it's doing? Financial assets 
are being purchased in the U.S. because it is a safer haven. It is hard to say, gosh, Europe is going to be out of woods. We don't even know what the weather is going to look like over the next couple of months, let alone whether Nord Stream comes back on or not. So that is tricky. China, as you talked about, Nick, earlier in your show around, around the COVID dynamics, around the U.S., the, the trade dynamics, China, Taiwan, et cetera, those are hard. So, you know, U.S. It has to be your, your, your source of best opportunity and the play, where the place where you sleep better at night. But you know, parts of the European, you know, we, we've been investing in some of the European credit markets, particularly some of the shorter duration. You get comfortable that, you know, you're not going to have rap, you know, significant defaults, particularly of big companies that, that have revenues, have sales outside of the region. So we've been doing some things in credit in Europe, again, you know, in moderate form because we're more comfortable in the U.S. And then tactically in other parts of Asia, we've made uh, we've, we've taken advantage of some opportunities. But, you know, it's no mystery as to why the dollar is well supported. Financial flows, corporate flows are certainly heading into a region that's that certainly seems to be well supported by the service sector and other parts of the economy today. And, and Rick, how much of that U.S. position right now is strictly energy because we're an energy exporter? at a time that a lot of the rest of the world needs energy desperately. And that's a macro factor that's not likely to go away right away. You know, it's a really, really big deal, David. I mean, it's not just him. You think about crude or nat gas. You know, the fact that, I mean, when the U.S. shifted uh, a number of years ago to being a net exporter of fuel, boy, you change the paradigm around your, your self-sufficiency, your independence. And you think about Europe. You know, I was in, I was in London this week. Uh, I was in Europe the week before. And uh, by the way, the inflation doesn't seem to be that bad if you're using dollars when you're traveling to those <laughs> uh, to those locales. And uh, but boy, you know, you look at Germany. You, know, you think about how vibrant, how strong, how delevered that economy is. But then all of a sudden, you have a nat gas reliance that really questions whether do you have to shut industry for a period of time. That becomes tricky. Italy becomes extremely tricky, and the UK is in a boy. I, I, I witnessed it firsthand. When you talk about fuel costs, and we talk about your electric bills going up three, four, five times let alone you've got the central bank has to raise rates, so you've got floating rate mortgages that are moving higher. Tough, really tough dynamics. And, you know, I think the world is going to realize, and, and by the way, not just fuel, supply chains, how you think about your supply chains, how you think about vertical integration of your company. I think a lot of this is part of why inflation probably stays a bit stickier over a period of time, is companies are going to be more thoughtful about what are their points of vulnerability and how do you how do you mitigate those going forward? Rick, help us make some money here uh, about where we really should be investing if we're thinking about for the medium long term. It sounds to me like short term credit. You've mentioned that more than once in Europe and here in the United States. Mm -hmm. What's going on? What beyond short term credit? So, I mean, I, I, yeah, I like the credit markets generally. I think I think you can take some risk in high yield. Well, you can you can pick up assets at eight to nine percent. You know that are you know reasonable credit quality. I think I think the high yield market. I think generally the credit market. By the way, I think it's cheaper than equities. You know, think about what's the, what's your return paradigm in equities uh, when you've got margin pressures, uncertainty of top line revenue. Are you going to create 10 to 15 percent return? Well, gosh, if I can get it in debt and I can get that eight to nine percent, that's I think that's intriguing. The short end of the curve to me, and I mean the ability to just take not a lot of interest rate risk. And not not a lot of credit risk. That that I also think is uh, is interesting. And listen, I, I I still think you need to be in the equity market. Yeah. And I think there's some opportunities in uh, in equities. I just think you got to think about the quality companies that have durable cash flow um, across industries, healthcare, parts of tech. Um, you know, we would call them uh, you know Garpy companies that are that are good cash flowing. Um, you know, that have some pricing power. You know, I still think you got to be in the equity market. Again, I, I'd rather. You know, for the first time in a long time, I'd, I'd rather be in more fixed income than equities because of where rates are today and you could be up the stack in a more uncertain time. Um, but listen, I still think equities are okay, are okay for the long term, certainly are okay. But it sounds like if I'm interpreting you right uh, on equities, you spend a lot of time looking at balance sheets and things like cash flow mm -hmm. and EBITDA and all those uh, old fashioned things, leverage. Yeah. Well, I, um, there's no better time to do that. And, and, uh, you know, we've lived in a kind of kind of a crazy world the last couple of years where all that stuff, when you're in QE, it's almost get as much beta in the portfolio, ride the wave yeah. as much as you can. And, and now I think you're going through an era where, gosh, is the coming. I mean, you see the volatility, some stuff. And by the way, the liquidity of these markets yeah. is not great. So if, if you have a bad piece of news, yeah. these stocks depreciate pretty darn quickly. So, yeah. you know, we're spending much more time on the intensity yeah. of yeah. gearing and cash flow.